Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Kira Epstein. I am the program coordinator at the Commonweal. And we are here today in one of the outdoor spaces that we've set up for the open, the Commonweal Open House 2022. Uh, we haven't been able to have an open house since 2018, so we're really excited to be here. <laughs> we are here today to talk about soul medicine and uh, how music making and dance and creative play are tools for individual and community resilience. And we have our host, Steve Heilig, who's going to be talking to Dr. Anna O'Malley, who is the uh, the director and founder of, of Natura Institute over at Kamala Garden. We have recordings uh, that we're going to be producing. Ken Adams does a great job of uh, recording and producing those for us. They'll be on the website in about a week or two. And we also have them on, uh, we have podcasts and videos on YouTube, on SoundCloud, on Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, and um, I think even Amazon Music these days. Steve Heilig and Dr. Anna O'Malley, thank you for being with us at the New School at Commonweal. Well, thank you very much, Kira, who does an amazingly wonderful job of coordinating this loose anarchic cause we call the New School, uh, which is now going well over a decade and hundreds of uh, talks on here on basically everything and anything, you know, it's pretty great. And it was probably six months ago that we talked about this opening, this uh, open house and having sort of an hors d'oeuvre before, which is this talk before it really starts. And what should we talk about? We, we kind of knew that this would be a somewhat intimate group of people. We actually have a nice turnout here today. And I actually was thinking of this, let's call this Sunday church before. So I actually, as a reward for all of you turning up here in person and online, um, I actually wore my power human beast today. And I'm an ordained minister of Universal Life Church. I do funerals, weddings, and all this kind of thing. So I can absolve everybody here of your sins and transgressions with you. So we were going to have a, a kind of informal, relatively informal, uh, just discussion of some of the things that uh, that happen at the Natura Institute and that our great guest here has been um, working on for some time. And one of the things about Commonweal, where I have evolved into kind of one of the uh, long-termers here, it's been like 28 years now that I've been affiliated with Commonweal. And I remember talking with Michael Lerner, even at the beginning, beginning and he said, the right people keep turning up at Commonweal. It's very rare that the wrong person does, and they don't last very long. But the right people keep turning up, and here's a perfect example, because you're not only working as a healer and physician at the clinic here, but now with this institute for some time now and working at Commonweal fits right in and it's kind of perfect for what we try to do and actually taking it forward in a way in terms of combining medicine, healing, environmental uh, awareness and activity and, you know, for lack of a better term, spirituality of various kinds too. So let's first welcome Dr. Anna O'Malley here today. One thing I want to ask, we, we put music into this, and we both are really into this. I have been a musician in the distant past and a music journalist, and, you know, it's kind of been an obsession my whole life. But I did about public health and epidemiology was my primary job. And we did an interview just last year on Zoom for the new school talking about medicine mostly. And we were, I was asking her about her personal life first, just how she came to be here. And she kind of surprised me because what I asked how does a Midwestern girl end up in San Francisco studying medicine? And she said, well, I was kind of following the Grateful Dead around. <laughs> sort of. Sort of. <laughs> so I said, well, well, cool. You know, we have some commonalities there. And actually, those of you who came in and heard the music, I picked it intentionally. It was Mickey Hart's Planet Drum CD, a combination of percussionists from all around the world doing wonderful rhythms and jams. And that kind of resonated with what some of the things you want to talk about is how does 
music bring people together? How does it serve as a healing force? How does it take you out of your own problematic, you know, personal problems and actually even do physical healing perhaps? So um, what is your first ever musical memory? Ooh. Well, when I was when I was really little, uh, I loved listening to the radio and uh, and just listening to the the storytelling. And I I remember um, being struck when I was like four or so um, by a Jim Croce song, <laughs> "Time in a Bottle," yeah. and, um, and and I knew all and like I I astonished my parents by being able to like sing along to all the words. And so like I just yeah. I have this uh, there's a part of me that that music lands in in a really deep way um so i'd say that's my first musical memory um but it's it's woven through my life in in so many ways and and i could say that so many of my formative experiences have been um shaped by the presence of music and and so many of of my challenging moments when I've had to navigate crossroads and um, and grapple with what it is to to be at a particularly challenging time or space, um, the ability to allow music to uh, move me through it and to be the backdrop for uh, my own like uh, cathartic transformation of, of an energetic state has been it's been like absolutely essential. And you learned some music lessons to play yourself. I did uh, piano and trumpet uh, at, when I was young, and, and played in various bands. Uh, and and at this point, I'm aspiring to learn to play the guitar. Uh, and when we were thinking about this this conversation last year, uh, and it put was put on pause by COVID and so many things, uh, we in the in the Commonwealth Garden were just coming off a, a fiddle camp where we had spent a week with people coming together around old time music, and I was just completely inspired by the um, the musical conversations that happened everywhere, where people were sitting together and able to just jam and until like three o'clock in the morning you know often when i've been in spaces and people are up until three o'clock in the morning there are there's a very different energetic driver of like <laughs> what's keeping people up but in this space it was like pure like just the joy and like the energetic aliveness and vitality that comes from being in a shared space around music and creativity and and like little micro village that emerged like of just sharing food and sharing song and it was so powerful um and so so when we thought about what okay so we're, we're in this we thought we thought last fall we're in a state of emergence you know we're, we're re-emerging from covid like we we didn't know that uh, delta went on the ground and blah blah was gonna about to shut things down um but like what what is the medicine that that we dear human beings who are going through such a challenging time um, in this pandemic, and we can anticipate that we're going to be going through more challenging times. Um, how do we uh, resource ourselves in a way that's joyful? Like, I love sitting around in circles, holding space for healing and for grief. That's absolutely important. And a counterpose to that is how do we come together around joy and dance and music and like the vitality and aliveness um, and and. What does that look like structurally on a community level? Uh, and you know, I, I I always bring it back to like what's what's the role of a healer at this planetary moment, and um, what are the spaces that we can be inhabiting joyfully uh, for our healing and, and catharsis as we resource ourselves for resilience. Well, you're in a fairly landed, as I say, in a great place to try this in a fairly unique environment here. Common wheel and at the garden, which is right up that way, straight behind us. Um, you know, medicine as a profession, you're dealing one on one with people as a healer, patient, physician. And do you ever see, so you're trying to take it, you know, upstream in some sense in terms of, of you know, preventive medicine, if you want to call it that. Do you, I mean, it's, it, it's a big calling, it's a big burden to try to fix bigger problems or at least cope with them but is it daunting to you stressful to try to think how do i 
you know, these people come, everybody has now an incredible amount of stress about the state of the world in the future and, and their own immediate life as well. So I'm just wondering if you take that on, you're taking on a big, a big test. You know, I, um, I adore my work as a primary care provider, and I know that there are some dear beings in this tent here that are under my primary care. And, um, and that at the end of, at the, at like 530, the end of the, the day of seeing patients, I, I feel that buoyant, like, I feel so much energy from what it is to be in a, a deep hearted connection with people and working to, to be of service. Um, uh, However, uh, the, the structure around those encounters is uh, there are a lot of constraints and a lot of bureaucracy and, and um, a significant number of limitations about how you can do the work and the depth to which you can do the work. And so uh, I, I appreciate, you know, I've been, I've been sitting with this, and in fact, I, I just recently wrote in the Point Race Light about this two loop model about like what it is to be have a system in your foot in one system that that needs to transform with compassion for all that of the people, the dear beings who are administrators who are like our, their lives are all wrapped up in the system. Like we can have great compassion for ourselves as we are in the system. Uh, and and as you as you point to like a great number, a majority of people in medicine, particularly in primary care, it's, it's particularly hard, particularly women in primary care. Uh, the the rates of burnout are really high, uh, and and the rates of suicidality are really high, and um, so and I I um, I feel that edge of of how hard it is to be bringing your full self to service uh, within a system that um, isn't really set up to allow you to. You, it, sometimes it feels like you have to choose between taking care of yourself and taking care of others, which of course is a false choice, but um, it takes like creating, well, back to this two loop model, like, you know, you can have a foot in the old, but how much do you keep your foot in a system that is going to bring like so much of your life and vitality out of you if you let it? Uh, and then this emergent second loop, which is, uh, the, the innovation, the possibility, the, that which is um, emergent and attuned to principles in nature and in life and in complex systems, which is like we don't know what's what's coming. We don't know how it's what what um, innovative innovative new opportunities will present themselves as we grapple with what needs to fall apart because it is degenerative and depleting of humans and the planet. We are we're, like any sector is grappling with this right now. Um, we feel it in our bones that we're depleted. Um, and so, so that is one of the things that animates me is like, where, where's the joy? Where's the play? Where's the delight? Like, how do we resource ourselves with good energy for that which is coming, that which is new? So yes, it's daunting, um, and it is. Uh, I am so uh, committed to what it is to like archetypically be in the healer um, energy that uh, I feel a lot of, actually, I feel like defending that archetype against the constraints of the system and lo looking for spaces to, um, to embody it and inhabit it in a freer way. And I'm uh, deeply grateful to the community of Commonweal for uh, for holding that space around what it is to be working with healing energy, uh, unfettered by the uh, the cultural, the dominant cultural conditioning and constraints of the uh, corporate system, such as they are. Well, I actually see you as as part of a legacy we have here. We had uh, for many years Rachel Naomi Remen here, who was working to help transform and humanize medical education in particular. And her work continued to spread to over half of all the medical schools in the country. So, I um, mean, she's retired now, and and now here you are. <laughs> um, That's quite, amazing. Yeah, she's yeah amazing. Um, and, and the issue, I mean, burnout isn't limited to just medicine and healthcare and, and those stresses, but we were talking before, it's a, it's a tough one because what we're seeing within the system confronting this, and this predates COVID, COVID really pushed it over the edge in terms of this is 
a lot of work to give healers, for lack of a better term, coping mechanisms, retreats, teaching yoga, uh, social events, book clubs, which is great, but it's almost like a defensive posture for it, and it doesn't change the system itself that, that we work within. And so that is just beginning now a movement to say, hey, the way the system is set up, in this country at least, for most, or many or if not most, is not sustainable the way it is now. Um, medical students, I teach medical students sometimes, they, they're looking at already, you hear this fear of people in medical school. It's like all I'm hearing from the older folks is how hard it is, you know? Um, and it didn't just really be like that. People were more excited, I think, in some ways. So. Do you think we can do something here in terms of, you know, basically setting some examples, some models, um, some examples for how people, and, and spreading it like Rachel did within medical schools, but into the actual caregiving system? You know, that, that I know you have a grant proposal out for things like that, so to set up something that then could maybe be replicable elsewhere too. I do. Um, I, at some of family and community medicine physician at UCSF, and um, I'm also an integrative medicine physician uh, trained with Andrew Weil. And I, uh, I believe that there's a particular potent opportunity to work within community, um, and community can be defined um, and in one way. Like here in West Marin, I, I serve the community of West Marin as a primary care physician. Um, and there's also community that's related to the work in the garden and, and more broadly community and earth, earth honoring and loving community, a culture reweaving community that is part of what's happening here at Commonweal and beyond. Uh, and so I, I do believe that, that we have a lot of opportunity to create innovative solutions and models that could be, could be replicable, could be um, in, in a, uh, collaboration with the system and perhaps um, and maybe that's a, a step but maybe also outside of the system I think there's there's trade-offs there uh, and yeah I think my my belief is that as as we get a little further down the road knowing that uh, that things really need to change that there will be funding uh, that will come to look at earnest, innovative, um, multi-solving, uh, or stacking of functions and, and the permaculture problems, uh, ways of working with healing that, that can be uh, done in community. And so, so in the garden, you know, we, in some of, we have a, a program called Art of Vitality that is working with that. It's like, it's a, it's a model of what is it to, to work in, uh, with the medicine of connection and into that is woven music and dance and, um, that sort of creative expression, as well as, you know, what is it to, to take deep dives into integrative medicine and spiritual psychology and connection with nature. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally believe I'm very, I'm very hopeful. Um, and I feel that there are many significantly entrenched forces within the way the system is set up that I think a lot of it has to be taken out of the system and brought back into the community and into other spaces uh, because I, wise and heads than I, have, um, have reflected back that it's unlikely that um, one person can significantly impact or innovate within or change the system, but that innovation is a real, it's a real possibility. Uh, and people, people follow uh, the the flow of, of good energy. Like we all know that it's that what we're doing right now is um, needs to change. That the system is broken, and that um, that there's a real opportunity for us to be opening up different spaces and models, so that in a way that feels um, feels like deeply healing for everyone involved. You know that it doesn't it doesn't good, feel good on some level for people to know that the the sort of care that their their provider is um, engaging in is depleting to her. You know, of course, it's the, the onus is on the individual to not let it be overly depleting. But um, yeah. So in, to answer your question, yes. <laughs> yes. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, so it's not one person. I mean, any one person who's a leader like Rachel was, and like you wrote your 
becoming yeah. too. I mean, I think of people like that as almost like an acupressure point to the system. And then people, you'll find people, like you say. So the famous Margaret Mead quote about a small group of people changing things is, has been shown to be true in many, many places. So maybe that can, can you know, be what transpires through here as well, you know. And it's not, you know, it's happening other places around too. Steve, can we talk about music and dance yes, and fun? that's where we're going to. You <laughs> read my mind. So... What was the best Grateful Dead show you ever saw? <laughs> you know, I want to I wanna just uh, speak to that. Like, I, so when I was in, so I'm, I actually I was too young to actually see the Grateful Dead because I was, I, the, real uh, Grateful. the real Grateful Dead, the real Grateful Dead, because um, I was, I was 16 with Jerry Guy in that last show at Soldier's Field, my, my girlfriend went to, but um, I was not allowed to go to that show. Um, but I, I did really connect with, as, as a young person, as a teenager, um, like what, with, with the notion that there is real potency in, and cultural transformative edginess that, that, uh, that happened certainly in the, the 60s and 70s, but that lives on in a, in a, a, a really potent way in places where um, where culture and music and creativity is held in high esteem and as, as a practice, and uh, that's actually why I came out to San Francisco uh, when I when it was time for me to do my away rotations in medical school. Uh, I came out actually to do an away rotation at the Haight Ashbury Free Clinic's outpatient drug treatment uh, clinic uh, on Clayton. Down in the Hague, and um, and my first night um, in town, I actually um, volunteered for Rock Medicine, which is when I met Dave Smith, and that's sharing with you. And, this is what we have in common from way back, yeah. <laughs> and so, so, so there's a truth, of, there's an element of truth that it was the Grateful Dead, actually, my love of that music, and and that sort of um, connection with with improvisation and with um, music and culture. But also culture change that uh, was was what was so intriguing about the Bay Area that I wanted because I knew I wanted to be part of change, not not um, necessarily through um, going to dead shows, but that like I I could I could feel that this is a place this is like you know it's right on the, the edge of the the continent and um, a place where you know Eastern spirituality um, meets what it, like the cultural creativity of of in California, the West Coast, and so um, yeah, that's yeah. and and it it feels it feels true. Um, I think to anyone who's uh, been here for any amount of time, that this is a, this is a fertile place for for uh, new ideas to take root. Yeah, we had uh, so we did a talk a few years ago with Peter Coyote up here in the upstairs, and you know he was part of the beginning of that with the diggers, and then the hate, and talked about the the risk of falling into cynicism that it didn't really change anything. But we came up with a list of 10 kind of movements or changes that actually did sustain and that you can point to that have happened that came out of that time, you know, and the music was a big part of it, you know. Mm -hmm. So what's your, I mean, what do you like to do in terms of a musical sense, in terms of bringing together people, whether here or elsewhere, in terms of the community, I mean, is it drum circles and, or, you know, things like that or? So um, I think, in most most recent time is in in our for example in the art of vitality uh, we have been in each weekend you know we, it's this program that that goes on uh, for a full year and and at some point in each weekend we come together um, and I will have put together a dance mix that is themed with whatever the energy is that we're we're working with that weekend be it connection with our ancestors or be it with you know what's what's moving in spring or sometimes we'll we'll bring we'll, bring together different elements um, that are in the circle so that we have this 45 minute um, musical exploration that moves us in, in sort of like you, you could think of like the five rhythms, Gabriel Rock, you know, just really um, considering like how we're warming up and how we're, we are in our bodies, but, and, and then also giving us a good opportunity to feel that rhythmic connection in our bodies and, um, and, and the joy of being with each other, you know, like, so, um, 45 minutes of, of listening to really amazing music and then feeling it in your body and letting it move you uh, 
it does all sorts of awesome uh, neurohormonal things. Like it releases oxytocin. We were talking about oxytocin a little bit beforehand. Like people think about, have heard maybe of oxytocin as like the, the love hormone or love drug. And, um, and what it is, is this, this amazing hormone that is released um, in birth with nursing children, with lovemaking, with touch. And it's also released in musical um, enjoyment and dance and music making. And, and it has this effect on us. So, so think about like, you know, if you can think about a time where maybe you've been at a concert and maybe you said, I actually just went to see Leela Downs with my, with my daughter. Um, she's amazing. If you don't know Leela Downs, check her out. Um, but we were at the Zellerbach auditorium and like you go into this auditorium and like everyone finds your seat and everyone's like, you're just kind of sitting and, um, and there's like, you know, you feel separation, but by the end of a concert, you, you start to feel like, Oh, we're, we're all having this shared experience together, even more so when you're dancing with people and like you're, so you've got all of these endorphins that are released and like oxytocin that's released and what it does, that, that hormone and, and all sorts of other things that we have no idea that are happening because we humans can only understand so much of the <laughs> of miracle of life. Um, but it, it brings us closer to each other. It allows us to trust each other. Our guard goes down. We're no longer in our limbic system, scanning for threat, fight or flight, like separation. Who, who's that person? Who's this? Is that person like giving me a negative vibe? That sort of thing that we humans can do, especially when we've been through trauma and we've all been through so much, some of us way more than others. Um, and so there's this, I think, important opportunity, this important role that music and coming together and dancing in community. Bolinas does this really well. I'm so excited that's going to be um, happening again uh, down in the plaza on Memorial Day. I've been on hiatus like everyone. Um, but it's it, it weaves community to to dance to music together. And uh, and it has a role in, in healing work. It absolutely has a role in healing work. Uh, another example that uh, was just, I, I hold with such fondness, uh, was when I did work in the prison system. Uh, when I was first out of uh, residency, I was a, a consultant to the California um, Department of Correction and Rehabilitation uh, with UCSF as the, the care was abysmal. And, um, and so we were trying to help improve the level of care there. Uh, it was in the hands of a federal receiver. and. I would go and stay, uh, stay at a hotel close to a, a institute, in, uh, institution for women and CIW. And I would stay over a weekend of my own time and, uh, and have these, these dance, like these mind, body, spirit jams with the women in the auditorium. And part of it was like, you'd sit in a circle and just breathe and share, do a little, um, you know, meditation. And then we would dance, like I'd put together a dance mix and it was like with funk and soul and, you know, hip hop. And um, it was so awesome to share an experience that's just purely about like being in our bodies and a joyful experience and like just feeling how, how high the energy, like, like these spontaneous soul train lines would, would emerge. It was just, it was such a joyful experience. And then to like drop back into a circle, this is kind of like an, an ecstatic, I don't know if any of you've been to ecstatic dance um, happenings, but it's just so awesome to then come back into a circle and just like share gratitude for that experience together and feel all, feel the love, like authentic, loving feelings with humans that just two hours before you, um, maybe we're like, oh, is this, what's the situation with that? Like, is he okay? Like, it's just, it's amazing how you can transform an energy state through music, dance, and shared experiences. It's, it's such a, it seems to be a fundamental, elemental, and universal kind of reaction to, to good music and humans, you know, that we have. You mentioned Zellerbach, and I'd actually forgotten about this. I took my goddaughter to her first concert when she was two. And it was a guy named Baba Mall, who's an amazing Senegalese singer and player and drummer. She was in my lap, so we didn't have to buy a ticket for her. So she's right here, you know. And they come out one at a time playing the drums. And then when they slammed into the electric, when it came on, 
she lunged back and broke my jaw particularly with her head. And, and she just, I mean, she was just ecstatic. When they got going, you know, I just, it was, I couldn't hold her. She was just, oh, you know. But it was really something. It was really amazing. And in all the years of, of writing about and going to, well, the other thing is, you talk about the need for this. I was the MC for many years at a festival called Sierra Nevada World Music Festival, which ended up up here in Mendocino, shut down, of course, during the COVID. And um, when it shut down, and now we've had two, two Junes have come without it, people are really kind of desperate and upset. They're just begging, please bring it back. Do, we'll do anything, you know, and our founder died too, so it's very difficult um, to do, but we're still hoping to. But people said, this is the highlight, this is what I live for every year, to come to this group, 5,000 people, family friendly, and dance with everybody and hang out, you know. So there is that need. And the other thing, over all the years of writing about music, I came up with this kind of weird theory that the more challenged, the more impoverished, the more difficult the life is in any one country, the more kind of energetic and ecstatic their music was. It was like a coping. So when you think of some of the countries in Africa, Haiti, Brazil, where poverty is rampant and conditions can be bad, the music is so joyful. It's very strange. And then, in, you know, in some of the other countries, you go to Northern Europe and it's all very dour, <laughs> you know, in a way, like a lot, of the, a lot of the music there, not all, but a lot of it. So it's just a very interesting thing. It seems to fit some elemental need of us, you know, to, to not only to hear it, but to be able to move to it with others too, you know. Um, so I, I think that it also, it does so much to break down separation and to allow us to see the humanity in other people and, and to transcend the the othering that can happen. You know, we're looking at people from different backgrounds and, and I think that this is an essential uh, role of, of music and culture at this planetary moment where, where we are all going to have to find ways to collectively, joyfully come together around some major issues uh, and and the, the more that we can see each other and our humanity and respond to each other um, perhaps out of our head and, and in, in our in an embodied empathic way um, the better and I just want to share that I, I saw this incredible band I've, I've just I've, I have a lot of pent-up music appreciation energy going on so I've been to a few concerts in the last month um, and I saw this band Daka Braka who's this incredible Ukrainian band from Kyiv, and they have since 2014 uh, been touring with holding uh, that this cultural ambassador way of being with their music and their culture, and like just standing in like this is what you what Ukrainian music and culture uh, looks like. It's not the same as as Russian, and like that's a false narrative. And here we are. And like just just witnessing them in their strength that this was at um, SF Jazz at the minor auditorium and just like the beauty of these four beings who um, have young children who have family who are who have fled war uh, to to be and like that um, like juxtaposed or or um, like with with the visual display like what's happening in their homeland um, it's powerful. Like really powerful to witness people in their humanity and the strength of cultural expression and beauty in the face of that sort of oppression. And so, uh, yes, yes to that. Yes, yes to uh, holding spaces and animating spaces uh, that where where we can see each other in our humanity and and just be in support and solidarity and and see each other and hear each other through music. Uh, this is somewhat related, especially related to the dead, but you you and I wanted to touch on the a different kind of resurgence, but related the full circle resurgence of research and interest in the psychedelic medicines as part of healing both individual and perhaps community as well. So, you know, uh, you mentioned Dave Smith, the Hay Clinic. He and I do a conference on this every year. It's actually a week from Friday on the 10th of June. It'll be on Zoom, and we're going to have some other top speakers on this because the great irony is, in addiction medicine at least, where he and I work, is that it's looking 
great potential for some healing there, but this was the big bad drugs that were considered, you know, going to kill you and ruin your, your genes and everything else. So um, it came, a lot of it came out of the musical world too. And now it's mainstreaming into the university research centers and particularly seems to be effective for things like post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, refractory long-term depression, things like that. So what are your thoughts there? Are you finding this fascinating? I'm totally fascinated, inspired, and, um, and moved by it. And, you know, and I, I, I mean, I, I came out actually because I uh, to, to San Francisco and did that experience at the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic's uh, addiction treatment center. Um, I, I'm so uh, interested and intrigued by addiction and uh, the phenomenon of, of addiction and, and what we do behaviorally. And it's quite relevant in, in so many facets of primary care and medicine. You know, um, you know, one one person's tobacco or one person's um, crack cocaine is another person's, you know, Twinkies. You know, we, we all have our thing in, in there, but for the grace of, of some divine mystery, could any of us go? And so, like, why is it that we, like, what is it that we're, we're um, seeking to, to medicate or soothe inside? And, and how do we gain access to to that space and and do the healing work that is is needed and you know and so as a, as a primary care physician uh, supporting many people who are going through so much and our medicines are are I mean there's so many ways to work with depression but but one of the the main ways for people in medicine is to to prescribe an antidepressant and. Uh, they are, you know, they're they're limited in, in what they can do, and 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 also it's kind of like a, a maintenance sort of a thing um, often, and so to have to have the possibility of having a space held around someone to um, to access in a very direct way the the core uh, like nugget of of wound or of of disease or. Um, empty void, whatever it is, to touch that in a in a held way, in a really direct, powerful way, uh, which is what psychedelic medicines allow in some way. Um, to me, it feels like, oh, there's, there's such a transformative healing potential right there, as opposed to kind of the band-aid approach that we're often, in, and it's not to denigrate the, um, you know, antidepressants have their place, absolutely. They're, they've, they've saved so many people's lives. Uh, and and I just I love the the uh, the notion of being able to do really deep transformative work in this sort of a way. Well, we should we should say actually in in, in the you know, back to addiction and that just that way there are now it's a different world at least in terms of uh, medication than it was ten years ago. There's much more effective uh, medications than there were just a decade ago, but still it's not. Uh, uh, fix it necessarily, and these the psychedelic meds of color we're talking about, you know, psilocybin, ketamine in particular, ibogaine. You know, um, they aren't a fix it too, but they allow people to break through some constraints they've had and then do the real work. You know, um, and I know I'm sure you know. I mean, the big uh, growing theory within the addiction is related to what is now called. Aces of reverse child experience, trauma. You're basically trying, you know, so much of addiction comes out of somebody's young, younger life and their trauma and trying to deal with that. And that's, I think, where this, these medications seem to be having the biggest impact with people. And I can tell you, I mean, I've seen it. I've done this with a few people who have had long-term problems and it's been a breakthrough for them. Certainly uh, a way to move forward. So it's been very interesting. On the other side, we always have to do a disclaimer, you know, it's not for everybody and uh, you don't just put it in the water, you know, so. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I think that that is a really interesting aspect of uh, often what's happening at, at, you know, within that musical festival container, because that's that's part of, of the vibe that's, and that's often like where people have their first experiences with that which I think speaks to uh, an aspect of our culture, which is, and it's not to make that wrong. I mean, that's, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a very core aspect of human nature to desire having altered experiences. And, uh, 
And we we kind of have a, a cultural impoverishment around not having a lot of of elderhood or mentored experiences or spaces of navigating that liminal realm or having threshold experiences how like we're um and so so often people are just kind of like trying to figure it out on their own and, and like having those experiences and so i uh you know i'm intrigued and inspired by the clinical application of psychedelic medicine and i also hold that there is a real um opportunity for the healer to um be engaged in this conversation around like how do we do this work within an intact like how do we reweave a culture that can can hold these experiences and um and also uh what's what's the message that that we each need to receive and and um how do we use something medicinally as opposed to recreationally and habitually? Uh, not to make recreation fun, like wrong, it's, we, we need to have play and, and fun experiences. And, and sometimes, you know, LSD is like one of the most sparkly fun experiences that, you know, a human has had, you know, some, some people have. Had, so but, I've heard, yeah. So I've heard, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but I, um, I love, could you share that quote that you shared about the, about the phone? Oh, so. Yeah, this is a, it's a famous one, actually. So the conference that we put on, we used to do it in, purpose, in, in person at UCSF, hundreds of people from all over, and had a whole panel on uh, psychedelic medicine. And there were a lot of people, there was the organization that co-sponsored this one year was called MAPS. You may have heard of Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Great people. Rick Doblin was one of our speakers, the founder. And there's all this enthusiasm and talking about how these are helping all these people heal. And I was a moderator and I brought up at a point this just this issue of, you know, there at least in medicine in LA, there's there are means rather than an end. You aren't doing this to become an acid head or whatever it is, you know. You're trying to move forward in your life. And I quoted Ram Dass. Now, when he was Richard Alpert at Harvard with Tim Leary, he was one of the instigators of the first, that big movement in the 60s that then was shut down. And he came later to say when he's Ram Dass and he wasn't doing all the time, he said, well, the idea is once you get the message, hang up the phone. And the interesting thing at that conference anyway, was a couple of people booed because their identity had been so wrapped up in now, I'm a, I'm a psychonaut, that's one of the terms, right? I wanna take things all the time, which you know, I'm not necessarily judging it too, but um, in a healing sense, I see it as something that you use as a tool to integrate and move forward in your life, you know, as to making that the object that, that you wanna get that that buzz <laughs> anytime you can, you know. You know and, and psychedelics also take the that incessant default mode network offline. Like that part of our brain that's always running the narrative of like, okay, what am I gonna do? Like what did I just do? What what just happened? Like like out of the out of this whole um anxious monkey mind, um, that psychedelics make that not possible and um, and open you then then you're available to all oh, and wonder and the mystery and the sparkliness and the beautiful and sometimes the dark and the shadow and, like all of this like cool um and it's also true that meditation and time in the natural world like in like really immersive deep time and communion with the natural world does the same thing and so i get curious about like what are those containers that we can create where we can still get into that same sort of like mystery of wonder, but we don't necessarily have to rely on um, taking a little bit of LSD or, or psilocybin to get there. Maybe we've had that experience. And so we know that we can recognize that, that deep presence and rarefied experience, but we don't have to be under the influence to, to get there. As you know, these are not simple questions and answers generally, and we both like to talk a lot, it seems. So if you have a question we can answer in, in a short time, go ahead. Anybody? <laughs> All shy. Yes. We sort of came here by accident today, and I'm so glad we did. Excellent. Um, we have so much in common, we don't even know each other. Um, I'm a physician at UCSF. Uh, we're both poets. Um, I'm formerly trained in music. I have a book from Random House on the doctor-patient relationship. I go around the medical schools and give talks on the humanistic value in medicine and healing. And Joan and I have uh, 
produced videos on the healing power of words, poetry, medicine, for PBS and otherwise. And I'm thinking that um, if we enlarge our circles to overlap, that people that have similar interests can come together in such a way to help create the kind of change that you're talking about in medicine. I just fired off a scathing letter to my congressman about the insurance companies and how they constrain the possibilities of healthcare and the ideal healing environment. So we should talk and I hope that we can expand this and other things into other areas. Thank you. Thank you. Another one. Okay, so what was your favorite Ripple Dead experience? <laughs> You know, what comes to mind is uh, just a moment in at a show uh, at Shoreline several years ago, where um, it was after intermission and in drums and space. And just and so for those of you who don't know, uh, there's always this moment where and in the in the concert in the arc of the concert where these brilliant musicians, including Mickey Hart, um, who we were listening to earlier, put on this incredible drum spectacular show. And it's like, it, it gets you so fully out of any little head trip that you might be into, and like so fully into, into the rhythm of drums. And I just, I, I don't know. There's so many different musical moments, but I, the one that where I, where I'm like in that rarefied, fully present moment and like totally one with the um, with the rhythms that are happening and and in like such a non ordinary re reality that um, it's just like mind blown. How about you? <laughs> oh gosh, there were quite a few, but I actually so I work rock medicine too, and uh, it. This is when Jerry Garcia was still around. So uh, other than, I mean, there's a, lot, there's a different story about him picking me up hitchhiking, but the, the other <laughs> oh, tell that. In the, well, I'll just think of from the 1980s. Now he was starting to have problems in getting into some harder drums in the 1980s. And he had a couple of instances where he actually was comatose and had problems and came back. And he was playing over in Oakland, the, the uh, Kaiser Auditorium. And I just remember this because I was uh, I was on duty that at Rock Medicine, so I was able having the right laminate to go right up on the stage. And I watched him come out and do an amazing. It's one of their famous me uh, the medleys, you know, uh, fire on the mountain, you know, and all this. And he was I'd never seen this, but he was actually dancing with joy while he was playing and soloing. And I was standing there, you know, literally as close as you, just a few feet away watching this. Wow. And then when they ended and the place is just going crazy, and I look over and there's a guy standing there, it's Bill Graham. And, and he looks at me and he goes, that's as good as it ever gets. Now get the F off of my stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there were a bunch of these, but yeah, there were just, there's just moments, you know, I and mean, it was hit and miss, I always thought it too, you know, I mean, even when Jerry Garcia was on, there were parts that I was not too excited about, but there was always something there, you know, when it was great, so. And, and it feels to me like there's there's such a, I mean, we have such a rich cultural legacy and heritage, you know, uh, well beyond Grateful Dead. And we're at this moment of like, how, how do we uh, create spaces where we can come together joyfully and, and actually see it as part of the work of healing and community? And, and, and really step into this moment and develop the, 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 the community structures. You know, so many of us are doing it really well already, so many communities. Uh, but how do we see the, and, and value and, uh, and inhabit like this joyful, creative community ritual, really, of coming together around music and dance and, uh, and celebration? You know, and 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 see that even as we go into ever more challenging times, likely that we can spiral up into ever more joyful co-created experiences. There you have it. So, thank 
you very much Thank for you. this. And she's going to be leading a tour of the garden oh, there, right? Yes. Uh, just after this, so for people who want to go. And thank you all for showing up today. You, oh yeah, you're all absolved of your sins and transgressions. <laughs> thank so you. The rest of the day is a bonus, right? So, Kira, thanks. Absolved. absolved. <laughs> uh, thank you, Steve and Anna, for being with us, and thank you all for coming, and all of you on the webinar, and those of you listening in the future. Appreciate you having having you here and being with us. We are going to uh, close here in a minute. And then we're going to do a switcheroo and Orin's going to come up. But I just want to say Steve Heilig and Dr. Anna O'Malley, thank you for being with us at the New School at Comet Whale. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. 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 Don't take it, don't, don't.